Hello and welcome to Slap on Location, where today we take a look at the track that has held the most NASCAR races in history, Martinsville Speedway. Hey, I'm Slap Shoes, this is Slap on Location, and that is Martinsville Speedway, the oldest active NASCAR track still on the schedule. It's been here since day one uh, for the NASCAR Cup Series, even since before that. The very first uh, NASCAR division that ever took off was in 1948, the Modified Division. They raced out here in July of that year. Fonte Flock won that race. Uh, and this track has been going ever since. It's had at least one uh, NASCAR uh, event on the schedule pretty much every single year, usually in multiple divisions every year since 19. Uh, 48. Uh, every uh, division you can imagine uh, has come through here. Bush North, this was as far south as they went. The Modifieds, uh, the convertible series, trucks, the sportsman uh, series, the precursor to the Xfinity series today, and of course uh, the Cup series. Uh, there's been hundreds and hundreds of races out here, and it was built in 1947 uh, by, by a guy by the name of H.C. Uh, Earls. Uh, he designed the place, uh, this little paperclip configuration, um, and it was really made that way out of necessity. Kind of like uh, Darlington has that egg shape uh, due to uh, that one guy who didn't want to sell the minnow pond. Well, there's actually a train track on the back stretch. Uh, this little plot of land right here, uh, this is all he had to work with. Uh, so that's why it has that pinched down paper clip. Uh, you might look at uh, Google Earth and you'll notice uh, the uh, train track isn't that close to the backstretch, so why did they make it so pinched in like that? The train track used to be a lot closer. In 2005, uh, NASCAR actually got Norfolk Southern, who owned that railroad, uh, railroad line, uh, to move it and divert it back so that they could uh, hopefully expand this place. There were some talks about uh, expanding it uh, and making it kind of like uh, Bristol, just a total big coliseum wraparound stands all the way around. But uh, of course in 2005 after they did that, uh, NASCAR had hit its peak after that attendance and uh, uh, TV ratings continued to go down uh, after that. The track was originally dirt, and uh, it was part of a, a really a, a big boom period uh, for stock car racing in America after World War II. Uh, during World War II, the production of all commercial vehicles stopped for the war effort. Um, and if you wanted a 1944 uh, Dodge, I mean, that was a Jeep. That was it. That was all you had to work with. Uh, so when they started uh, production of civilian vehicles again in 1946, 1947, everybody got rid of those old 1941, 42 uh, coupes, those Ford and Chevy coupes that are really popular. They ended up being really popular in the modified division. Uh, and, and the used car market was so messed up back then that sometimes it was uh, cheaper to buy a whole functioning 1942 Ford than it was to just uh, sell it for scrap. It was worth more as, as scrap metal. But because these cars were so absurdly cheap, a lot of guys who uh, had all this extra GI Bill money uh, after World War II, they had all this extra capital, they had these cheap cars, they started souping them up, started racing them, and places like Martinsville got built all over America. Uh, most of those are gone now. Martinsville still persists. Originally, it was a dirt track. Uh, they paved it in 1955, and in 1956, they had their first 500 lapper here. And that is a tradition that continues all the way to today. You show up in Martinsville, you're going here for 500 laps. And uh, these races have historically been a real just battle of attrition. There was a race here in 1951, had 20-something cars show up, four finished. Uh, and even today, uh, I remember last year, 2020, Joey Logano uh, came out here. Before the first stage break, he had lapped like 26 cars. I mean, this this place just lends itself to being completely dominated by some guys and other guys just barely clinging on to life. I'm sure the, everybody remembers Dale Jr.'s impromptu modified that he made where you know they got into a, a scuffle early on. They had to rip the fenders off of it. I think he came home in like seventh that day. Martin Truex uh, won the race in 2020 after he had to take off a, a fender. <laughs> uh, ended up helping him out and uh, cooling off the brakes and everything. Uh, but yeah, that's just what Martinsville's like. It's it's classic short track racing. Uh, it's got 12 degrees of banking. I think that's being kind of generous in the corners and the corners are super tight. Uh, so the only way to get around somebody is either dive bomb it down one of the long straightaways 
or just punt somebody out of the way. And at Bristol and some of these other short tracks where they got enough banking, uh, there's typically enough room and enough banking to catch you and you can just slide up the track, not here at Martinsville. You've got one of two options. You can either uh, get punted and go into the wall or you can gun it and spin yourself around, but that leaves you with another problem. Now you have uh, uh, everybody in traffic coming right at you. And so, you know, it's kind of like pick your poison. Would you rather die by a gas chamber or electric chair? Neither one's going to be that pleasant for you, but sometimes that's the only option you got. Martinsville has historically been uh, kind of a place where underdogs could uh, have their day in the sun. And that's because since all the lower divisions came here, uh, even late models, they have the Martinsville 300 out here is a classic race. Uh, for late models. If a guy works his way up the ladder, he, he, he's probably come to Martinsville every single step of the way. Uh, so it should be no surprise that Josh Berry, who got a ride with uh, Junior Motorsports, ended up coming here and winning because he's been in the Martinsville 300. He's been who knows how many races out here and tracks just like it. So, uh, you know, when you have uh, younger guys and rookies come up through the field, this is really a great judge of their talent because, you know, they've probably made starts out here in a late model. They've come up, they've come up through the trucks, the Xfinity series. And now when they finally get here in a cup series, there's nothing new to them. They already know this place, but when they show up to Kansas and one of these big mile and a half, two mile tracks, they can throw them for a loop because they've never driven on anything like that before. But here, this is pretty familiar for them. The winningest driver in Martinsville history is by long shot, uh, the King Richard Petty. He won out here 15 times. I think Darrell Waltrip second with 11. Uh, and Martinsville is just across the North Carolina border into Virginia. It's pretty close to Randleman and Level Cross. So this was sort of like a, a home game for Petty Enterprises. It was always a big point of pride for them to come out here and do well. And even uh, past their glory days, you know, I remember Bobby Hamilton would come out here and he'd run well. John Andretti got his last win out here driving for uh, Richard Petty. And even Bo Wallace, Eric Amarola, and Eric Jones, when they race for the King, when they show up here, they usually do pretty well because the pressure's on them. Hey, if you're coming to Martinsville and you're driving that Petty Blue 43, you had better do pretty good because uh, the second and third most important races, two of them, right behind the Daytona 500, are these two races at Martinsville. Uh, yeah, it's a very historic venue, and honestly, it's kind of a miracle it's even here. Uh, in the 1990s, mid-1990s, it was a real question about whether or not this racetrack was going to survive. Uh, North Wilkesboro was gone. Darlington in the early 2000s was on the hot seat. Rockingham went away. And there was some concern that Martinsville wasn't going to survive. If it did, it was probably going to lose a race. But um, in 2004, uh, the daughter of uh, uh, Earls, the guy who originally built the place, she sold her... Uh, a share of the Speedway over to ISC. And then NASCAR bought the track outright. And then when they diverted that railroad and they had the plans to expand, it kind of you know made everybody breathe a sigh of relief. They knew that Martinsville was gonna be here for the long haul. And even though uh, they've removed some seats over the years, I think the seating capacity is 44,000. Uh, it still gets good ratings and it still gets pretty good crowds to show up for it. And it gets a lot of uh, races uh, throughout the year. The Xfinity Series uh, now comes here twice a year. Trucks have always come here twice a year. Cup Series comes here twice a year. Um, you know, and then you have all the late model uh, series that love to come out here because it's such a historic venue, such a challenging venue. And uh, yeah, this is a, a track that's, you know, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Property taxes are low. Uh, not a whole lot of room to upkeep it. So it's it's quite profitable for them. So that's why it still remains out here today. That and it's uh, super historic too. So we're going to go to the inside of the track and I'm going to show you a few things, a few quirks about the track uh, that have uh, developed over the years. All right, so we're in the grandstands now. And as you can see, there is about a two and a half lane wide strip of concrete down there in the corners. They added that in the early 80s and the reason was uh, the reason behind that was uh, between the uh, Modifieds, uh, the Bush Series, the Cup Series, uh, they were absolutely tearing up this asphalt. They were just really digging in there and just ripping it up because asphalt is pretty soft. It's actually a petroleum product. It's what's left over uh, after they get rid of all the jet fuel, uh, diesel, kerosene uh, out of it, uh, just the asphalt's left. Put in some gravel, some aggregate, and uh, you know, boom, you got asphalt pavement. 
So th they were ripping it up down here. Just the turns were so tight and the, about 12 degrees of banking. Uh, it doesn't look like it on the camera, but when you're here in, in person, you're like, man, that's quite a bit of banking down there. Uh, and uh, th th they're just, they're having to repave the track just about every eight years. I mean, most asphalt tracks can last 20 years. Uh, so what they decided to do was bring in concrete and have like the bottom two and a half lanes paved with it because concrete's a whole lot harder. Well, why didn't they just pave the whole track like that? Well, concrete's more expensive than asphalt. So what they decided to do, just put it down where it's a problem. And you'll notice they had the concrete all the way sort of down the, the uh, uh, straightaway, but on the approach, it's much more abrupt where it uh, starts off at and it just carries on longer. What they were worried about was when you came out of the corner, if you would transition from concrete to asphalt, there'd be a bump there. I know Greenville Pickens uh, in 2017, they paved the bottom two lanes with uh, new asphalt, left the old asphalt there. And there was a, a tremendous bump coming out of turn four and turn two down there. So uh, if they had just winged it out, made it go a little bit further, they wouldn't have had that problem. So that's what Martinsville decided to do. Another thing you'll notice is the U-shaped uh, pit road. Uh, it starts over here in turn four, goes all the way around, ends in turn two. Used to as a split pit. Uh, they had a uh, front stretch pit and a back stretch pit, uh, and there was no access road or anything. Once you came out of the pit lane, you basically went right into traffic where everybody was trying to make the turn, and there were you know, wrecks down there. It was awful, so they decided to uh, add in an access road uh, in the early 90s. I believe it was 1994 they added that access road. So there'd be a, a lane down past the grass uh, where the uh, pit, pit lane is now, and you could get up to speed there and then come out, and then you'd miss that traffic. Problem was, if somebody was trying to get to the backstretch pit lane, uh, you basically would uh, cut them off and there were still wrecks down there. So finally in 1999, they decided to just make it one big pit lane, one big U-shape, and that was the end of it. Just kidding, uh, they ran into another problem. Now they have these curved pit boxes down here. Very hard to pit in. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, guys have a hard time nosing in there and then trying to get out just because it's curved. And even if you don't have a problem getting in and out of it uh, and getting the car parked right, well, now you got all this traffic trying to uh, make the turn. You know, they're two and three wide deep and you're trying to get out of your pit box. Uh, typically, if there's a wreck on pit road in Martinsville, it doesn't happen on the straightaway. It happens on, on the turns over here. So that's always a problem. And it's one of the tracks that uh, no matter what, uh, whether it's the green flag or a yellow flag, there's always a problem in the turns. That's where all the action is. Uh, just at the uh, three and four and one and two, that you gotta always keep an eye on it at all times. These are the real problem areas. And that's what makes this track unique and different than from any other short track in America. You know, you got, I think it was Matt Kenseth said, you got two quarter mile drag strips and a U-turn at each end, and that's the, that's the racetrack. So it, it's super, super difficult to navigate, and even under caution, still difficult to navigate because there's just so much that you have to, to deal with, getting in and out, uh, the curved pit boxes, and those curbs down there, they look flat. They actually come up probably about that much, and they don't have much slant to them. It, they're sitting at about a 70 degree angle, and uh, right now with these tall sidewall tires we got, it's not that big of an issue. And they run such a low air pressure here anyway, uh, they can kind of deal with it if they scrub up against it. With the uh, next gen car, they're running that, wide, that taller rim. I think it's about three inches uh, wider uh, and they're gonna have a shorter sidewall. That's gonna be a problem. I wouldn't be too surprised if when the uh, next gen cars come down through here, they're you know, cutting tires, busting up rims left and right. So. This will be one of the races I'm going to pay attention to during the next gen era. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that a lot of uh, the teams got this track circled on their calendar because it's hard enough with uh, the old cars. With a new car, it's going to be a, a whole new can of worms. And, you know, the, the uh, next gen cars, each team is lim limited to seven cars. And this is one track where a car is going to get busted up. It's going to get uh, uh, bent sheet metal, uh, just ripped up fenders, busted tires, busted rims, you know, just you, you name any problem you can think of, this track creates it. So anyway, I'm Slap Shoes. This has been Martinsville Speedway, and uh, this has been Slap on Location, and I'll catch you next time. 
All right, so it wouldn't be a trip to Martinsville without a Martinsville hot dog. Of course, you know, you got to get it all the way. Oop. A little bit of relish, some chili, the red hots they got, some onions. Let's see if this beats the uh, Hoffman hot dog down there in uh, Oswego. It's all right. Definitely the chili and the onions do a lot of heavy lifting and the relish too. The Hoffman hot dog up in us we go. I got to give that one the, the uh, edge up over the Marchville hot dog. Because uh, at least with the Hoffman hot dog, you know, the meat actually does all the heavy lifting for you. That's where all the flavor is. And this relies on, on the uh, condiments they put on it, onto it. But hey, the Hoffman hot dog was five bucks. This is two bucks. So you can get Two of these and a water for the same price as one Hoffman hot dog up in New York. So, uh, which one do you like? I don't know. Pick your poison. They're both pretty good. Can't beat it. This entry into the series was chosen by one of my patrons, SPC Zippo. Each month, I enter my $15 and up donors into a year-end raffle to choose the destination for a Slap on Location episode. If that sounds like something you're interested in, check out the link down below in the pinned comment. Until next time, y'all take it easy.